So I started my garden exactly three years ago and early on, it was terrible. I couldn't grow shit. Things were getting destroyed by bugs, eaten by animals, or just not really growing well in general. But gardening is a journey about exponential growth and exactly three years to the day I started, I am now harvesting pretty much all of the vegetables that my family eats and some of the fruit. And today I'm gonna be breaking down exactly how I got there in a really simple to follow 10 step process where no matter what size garden you have or what level gardener you are, if you follow along on this process, you will optimize your harvest. All right, up first is the biggest variable by far, which is space. You're gonna need space to have a garden or grow your own food, which is gonna vary dramatically depending on your situation. Now, I'm sure a lot of you are living in an urban setting and space is very hard to come by, but I will say one thing. If you are passionate enough about growing and you have that itch, you will figure out a way to grow food. Point being, I was living in my apartment in Brooklyn 10 years ago. The building had a roof rooftop that was exclusively used for throwing parties, covered with just beer bottles and trash. I invested $1,500 to start a little mini garden up there and transformed what was a pretty shitty roof into an urban oasis. <laughs> at least for me, it was a little piece of heaven at that time. Now, was it dramatically lowering my grocery bill? Absolutely not, <laughs> but it got me in the game. I started connecting more to what I was eating, learning how to grow food for the first time, and most importantly, it got me dreaming of bigger plans, like getting a space like this, which is the current garden I've been building out for the last three years. A lot of you have followed this journey. This is one acre in the suburbs of Long Island. And I would say about 50% of the property is growable with the sun. And I am slowly using every piece of space possible to grow food, which I'm sure my neighbors are slightly confused when they walk by. But gardening and growing your own food, at least in this country, will always be counter culture to some degree. Not many people are doing it, especially in a suburban environment, but do not let that stop you. Growing food is as natural as it gets. Humans have been doing it forever. All right, so you have your space where you want a garden. The next logical step is designing that garden, which to me is one of my favorite parts of gardening because you can really let that inner creativity just shine. Now, one thing I've learned is it's important to not be too attached to the existing space, whatever was there. We're trying to create something special from scratch that's really just like a showcase of your own personality. And it's also important to get at least a decent understanding of the way the sun works in your environment because it's to create little microclimates, and the more you understand what's going on the less changes you'll have to make later on in your garden so i was basically starting from scratch in this garden outside of one existing plot that they were growing in. this was the sunniest space on the entire property but it was completely overgrown so i ripped everything out i weeded it i brought in a bunch of compost and some wood chips got some beds in there and started planting right away the next thing i did was put in a deer fence for protection which also created some nice boundaries in the garden and gave me the ability to create a nice entrance. And I love Japanese architecture, so I went with the sort of Japanese inspired pergola. Immediately after that, right in the center of my garden, I put in a mini little orchard because I love fruit and it was always a dream to just grow a ton of it. And fruit is very expensive. So I have all different types of Asian pears, apples, peaches, nectarines. And then on the perimeter of the garden, I planted some cherry trees and some persimmons and then vining fruits all over the fence line. And it's vital to get those fruit trees in as soon as possible because they're gonna take at least two to four years to start producing. Next, there was an existing area with a ton of wildflowers and I wanted to amp this area up a bit. So I created a little winding path with the sitting area and brought in a ton more local native wildflowers with the idea that this space would be dedicated to bringing in pollinators to the garden, which is super important. Next, there was a big walnut tree in the garden that had to come down because it was leaning towards the house. Oh! So I ended up slicing that up for lumber, which is finally dry after two years. And my dad has been already making some incredible furniture with it. But the milling process destroyed a big part of the front area of the garden. So instead of just growing the grass back that was there, I built four raised beds and I brought in wood chips to fill in the entire area. And after a year, I saw that the grapes on my property were growing very well. So I ended up building a very mini little vineyard, planted a bunch of grape vines, which should produce a ton of grapes in the near future. So that's been three years of progress in the 
main growing area and I've got a lot more that I'm doing and things that I want to do. But before I get into that, let's talk about something very important, which is your gardening approach or your method or your style, which is so massive in the success of your garden. Now, I'm not a gardening expert. There are other YouTube channels dedicated to that. And what I'm going to do is tell you some of my favorite that were extremely inspirational for me in really getting up and going and developing my own style. We've got James Pergioni, Epic Gardening, Hugh Richards, Charles Downing, The Millennial Gardener. These creators were the biggest inspiration for me and it's just like getting into cooking. You find a few creators you like, they all have different styles and then you pick the pieces that best suit your needs. So the gardening methods that I'm using are kind of a mash of all the things I've learned from them, plus books that I've read. Of course, there's thousands of amazing gardening books out there. But I would say overall, my garden has that James Pergioni style food forest where you've got a ton of fruit trees working in tandem with garden beds producing a lot of vegetables. But all of my garden beds are a no dig style where I'm not digging up anything. I'm not disturbing the soil microbiology. I'm just adding compost on every year to feed the soil. And when I first started gardening, I will say I was extremely frustrated with growing vegetables. Nothing would grow. And what I learned was that my soil just really wasn't alive at that time. Over time, as I added a lot of compost and organic matter, the bugs started coming, the microbiology really started to thrive. And that's when things started to grow, as well as really just enhancing the diversity of things that I'm growing. And this garden is completely organic. I'm following as many permaculture rules as possible, trying to mimic a really diverse ecosystem that you would find in nature Nature, giving you the most healthy and flavorful vegetables and fruits possible. All right, so the next thing I wanna talk about is your garden security, because you are about to plant an all-you-can-eat buffet for every animal and every critter in your local environment. And of course, you're gonna be sharing food with a lot of them automatically. There's no way to keep everything out. I mean, the deer in my area are out of control and they've only gotten worse since COVID. So one of my early investments, my biggest investment in the entire garden is this thing right here, this big deer fence. This is eight feet tall, high enough that a deer won't jump over because they will pop right over a standard six foot fence. And I looked at cheaper non-permanent solutions, but I ended up just biting the bullet, investing in this fortress, and it was one of the best decisions I ever made. And I know that because I've opened this fence or left it open a few times. A deer has wandered right on in and just decimated my garden in one night. That's all it takes. Now this deer fence was a bit of a double whammy because instantly it opened up about double the amount of growing space. Because as you can see in my garden, I use it as a trellising system for so many different plants. Anything vining, I'm growing on this fence. Pretty much every single square inch of growing space is taken up by grapes or berries or tomatoes or melons. So obviously your security system doesn't have to be this intense, but I will say if you're thinking about a fence, try to think about how it can be multi-purpose so you can actually use it as a growing space as well. All right, let's talk about chickens or animals in general in your garden or your homestead or whatever you're doing. So of course you don't need animals, you don't need chickens to have a proper working garden. I was lucky enough to inherit this entire chicken coop. Now in that time, I've also raised a bunch of chicks from babies. A lot of you followed along on that journey. So I've got a decent amount of experience over the last few years with chickens. And to answer the main question that most people have, are chickens financially viable versus just buying eggs in the store? And the answer is 100% no, <laughs> they are not. It is a much better deal even to buy really high-end eggs at say a farmer's market for $10 a dozen versus raising your chickens between the cost of upkeep of the coop and feeding the chicken. You're never gonna win that game with a backyard flock of say five to 10 hens. But there's one thing that most people completely overlook when it comes to having chickens in their garden, which is their natural fertilizer, AKA their shit. So I put bedding or just wood shavings in my chicken coop. The chickens sleep there, they poop on it, and then every week I clean that out and pop it in a separate compost bin right next to the coop. This mix right here, you've got the nitrogen in the poop and the carbon in the wood chips is all you need to break down into some incredibly potent 
compost. Now, if you have a deep bedding system in your coop, you don't need to do separate composts for this. It just breaks down in the coop. But I'll just mix this up every few weeks. And after a few months, I can sprinkle this in my garden. And I can say that my vegetables didn't really start growing well until I started adding this nitrogen rich compost to the garden. Things just started exploding. And it really showed me the importance of animals in your garden ecosystem. So yes, the homegrown eggs are incredible. They blow away the standard supermarket eggs. That is one element, but the fertilizer is just as important in that cycle of life. And overall, chickens are really easy to raise. The most important thing to know is that every other predator in your area enjoys the taste of chickens just as much as humans. So your main job outside of feeding them is keeping them safe. So making sure when you do invest in your coop, it's got to be secure. And there's plenty of detailed videos on YouTube on how to do that, but take your time and do it right. All right, so we've made it over to the composting area to talk composting, which is essential for every garden at some level, because the thing is composting can be a little bit overwhelming. You can take composting to the highest level and have systems that are heated and break down in one month, or you can do lazy composting, which is what I do. I just have a three bin composting system where I throw in any organic matter and vegetative growth from my garden, whether it's weeds from the property or dead plants, it's all going in the compost system. And I do my best to balance the green nitrogen stuff and the brown carbon stuff. I do my best. I'm not great at it, which is why this compost doesn't get hot. But if you just throw everything in a bin, it will break down over time and turn into what looks like soil that you can throw back onto your beds to feed it. Now over here, I have two plastic bins for all my food scraps. And the plastic is to ensure that animals don't get in because they will come for those tasty food scraps. And I just take bins of my food scraps, throw them in the compost, and then to balance out all that nitrogen, all that fresh stuff, I take these wood chips right here pine shavings and I throw that on and I just sandwich them in between and that breaks down into this over here which is beautiful compost that I can throw on my garden to give it more nutrients and life. And the beautiful thing about making your own compost is that you're less reliant on bringing in compost from outside sources which is a big money saver and really closes the loop in your own garden ecosystem. So I would say in your garden at the very least just one of these bins, just start making compost. It's really simple and it will open you up to wasting less. So let's talk watering. And just like composting, a lot of different ways you can go about watering your garden. Simplest way is just let mother nature do its job. And when it rains, your garden grows. But ideally you have some type of automated system to have more regulation in your garden and also to do less work. I have a drip system that's set up to an automatic timer connected to my hose. This waters the entire garden. And I love drip style watering because it goes direct to the source. You get less evaporation, less water waste. But I will bring in sprinklers from time to time if it's really hot or I need to germinate seeds that I planted. And I recently, about a year ago, got this big jug right here. A thousand gallon rain collection, which is hooked up to my gutter, collects the rain, fills this thing up, and then ultimately I put this back into the garden in some form. Now, right now I just have it hooked up to a hose and I just water things that are dry around the garden. But I would like to build this system out to the point where where I am watering my entire garden with rainwater because rainwater is a much cleaner source than the municipal hose water because it's not treated. It's gone through the filtration of the sky, which is magical. And it's why your garden looks so amazing after it rains. So stay tuned and we'll see how I continue to develop my watering system in my garden. All right, we're in my basement in my seed starting room to talk about something very important, which is starting your own seeds, probably the easiest easiest way to save a bunch of money right up front. Because if you go to nurseries, you will get crushed by buying little seedlings. The cost adds up quick. I've been there many times to the point where I'm like, I'm done with this. I am starting my own seeds. So I bought this three tier indoor grow system because seeds do not like temperatures that are really cold or really hot. So you need to create an environment that they're gonna thrive. And in the summer when it's super hot, this environment is controlled and where I'm starting seeds. Seeds. And also nurseries are generally gonna be stocked up on seedlings in the beginning of spring, and that's generally it. But if you're serious about growing food, you want seedlings in the spring, the summer, the fall, the winter. We want little seedlings ready to be planted at all times. And the only way to do that is to do it yourself. Now that setup could be as simple as putting them in a window that gets a bunch of direct sun, or you set up a 
mini little greenhouse outside. Whatever it is, buy yourself some seeds or save seeds. Get yourself some trays and start growing your seedlings for massive cost savings in the garden. All right, speaking of saving a ton of money, let's talk about these juicy harvests. So a lot of the stuff I've talked about before is investment in systems to really get your garden operating. Now let's talk about the payoff. And for me, in the first year, maybe year and a half, I probably had a 25% success rate with my greens. My soil life just wasn't developed enough. I didn't have enough diversity in my garden. So things got destroyed by insects and animals. And I just didn't know a lot about gardening. But as you invest in your systems, as you improve as a gardener, the harvests start to come and they start to come big. Let me tell you, it's kind of exponential. It's not like a slow increase. It's like every year seems like an explosive growth compared to the year before. I am officially at the point where I can go into my garden every say three days and treat it like my own personal farmer's market. I see what's fresh, I pick it, and I let the produce decide what I am cooking for that day. So in just about two and a half years with some early struggles, I am eating about 90% of my own vegetables and maybe 10% of my own fruit at this point, but I think that number will dramatically increase every year to the goal of getting 90% of my fruit as well. Obviously I can't grow bananas yet. I do have some ideas in the backyard for that. So again, it was a bit scary investing in the garden early on because it doesn't feel like it's quite giving back to you. But once the system's there, gardening is almost free if you complete that loop. If you're composting yourself, if you're saving seeds, growing your own seedlings, all you gotta do is put in work at that point. And I love the work. That's at least in the growing months. You might be thinking, what do you do in the winter? And that brings me into winter gardening. We're gonna head out to the garden to talk to Todd, who's setting up a system that can help me grow food all winter long. Yo, Todd. Hey, how's it going? Good, how, how, how are you doing? Enjoying the, the nice weather since yesterday it was rainy. Yeah. So just getting this thing ready for the cover. How close are we to the plastic cover? Uh, very close. So we're doing some wind supports and some, you know, some snow supports, and then we're ready to close off the end walls, and then we cover it with the top. A high tunnel uses the sun as its heat source. So as the sun hits it, it gets warmer in the structure and the structure is closed off in a way where you're playing a game. You're trying to hold as much heat as you can in the dark parts of the night until you reach morning and the sun can hit it again. And that keeps your crops alive through the cold months. I can be growing in here all winter long? You're not gonna grow tomatoes and cucumbers in the winter. You're gonna grow carrots, beets, kale, various salad greens, spinach. Those are the things that like cold weather. So you're gonna kind of work with the season there. And then what am I growing in the summer in this? The main crop grown in high tunnels, believe it or not, is tomatoes because you can plant the tomatoes so much sooner than you normally would. Cucumbers as well. They like to run up trellises and you can get a lot of cucumbers. And yeah, that's what you do in the summer. Why would this be good for a homesteader or just a home gardener? So being able to grow as much of your food as possible, having a high tunnel or, you know, just some form of season extension is absolutely vital because you'll be able to grow all year round and, and have some form of fresh crops to supplement storage crops like, you know, onions, garlic, and all the, the winter squashes. Our structures are built to last. Heavy gauge, large diameter steel tubing. For I mean, the, look at this. The main supports, <laughs> you know, you got some big, big tubes. The intricacies of the members we have running the full length for wind that can help support weight for snow. High quality end wall material, you know, it's, it's really, really heavy duty. So it's built to last. We have YouTube videos for almost every single step of the process. Todd's also a YouTuber. I do my best, you know, <laughs> because these are DIY kitted. Anyone can build them, but the videos make it a lot easier. The high tunnel you're building is a 14 and a half a wide structure. It comes with a few special features that will help you grow all winter. Two layers of plastic. It's going to be inflated as an extra layer of insulation. Hard plastic on your end walls that's also insulated. It's a double layer. And you'll also have roll up sides. So if it gets hot in there, because when the sun hits this, it does warm up. Even in the winter, you can easily roll up your sides and without electricity, ventilate and let that hot air out. So you'll be able to grow all winter, you know, in the summer and also keep the temperature regulated. Nice. Well, this is going to be a game changer on this homestead operation. I'm excited to get this thing up and going. Can't wait to get this thing covered. Look what we have here. We've got rows already in place. I've got seedlings from the basement. I'm ready for some winter planning. This is just super inspiring coming into this warm space, feeling like I've got opportunity in the cold months. Total game changer. But for me, the goal of this video was to spark inspiration at any level of garden. Gardening. The key is just getting in the game so you can start learning and connecting with what you're eating. If you want more garden videos, check this out right here.